Good morning, everyone. To officially st start our webinar, let me have the honor to, to present to you one of the country's leading misologists. She is a social <laughs> anthropologist and our dear Deputy Director General for Museums. To give the opening remarks, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Ana Maria Teresa Labrador. Hello. Uh... Good morning, A. You don't have to introduce me in that way, so I'm, I'm okay. So uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, participating in our uh, webinar. It's uh, towards the end of our celebration of the National Heritage Month, and I'm glad that you were able to come and join us. Uh, this morning, this is part one of our two-part uh, uh, webinar on of galleons and churches, the Spanish influence on our uh, maritime trade and also our architecture. So thank you, architect uh, Bernadette Balaguer for uh, uh, pre preparing this presentation this morning to add to our knowledge of um, built heritage tradition, especially uh, the Kaisasai church. Uh, this is one of our special program because uh, we're doing this even in the middle of the pandemic, but we need to really focus our attention on restoring the, uh, the this very special uh, church in Paal, Batangas. No? And, uh, but I also want to thank uh, uh, architect Mel Bahava for really uh, accepting this morning's invitation to be our discussant. No? And we'll really um, learn so much from her with her uh, extensive knowledge of built heritage traditions in the Philippines. So thank you so much. And uh, please uh, let's enjoy this morning's session. And, um, and I'm, I hope that uh, like me, um, you are looking forward to learn, learning something new. Thanks so much and good morning. Thank you, Doc Anna. So again, welcome, dear participants, to this webinar series entitled Of Galleries and Churches, Local Influence in Maritime Trade and Architecture in the Philippines During the Spanish Colonial Period. Led by our National Museum researchers from the Maritime and Underwater Cultural Heritage Division and Architectural Arts and Built Heritage Division. This two-part series of online lectures will discuss galleons and churches as reminders of our forebears' achievements in trade, commerce, and architecture, implying the extent of in indigenous knowledge and skills they mastered to satisfy the local demand for trade goods and built structures, most especially during the colonial period from the 18th century onwards. Additional insights on the archaeological and architectural objects related to the significance and local preference of certain pigments will also be included as starting points of discussion for our ongoing research for an upcoming exhibition. The webinar program includes a brief reaction from uninvited partner experts in the fields of architecture and archaeology and an open forum. Today's lecture is entitled Local Influences on Philippine Churches, the Nuestra Señora de Caizasay Church and Associated Structures in Taal, Batangas. Let me now introduce to you our lecturer for the day. She obtained her degree in architecture from the University of Santa Tomas and became a registered and licensed architect in 2017. She served as a design architect in Visionary Architecture Incorporation, one of the top architecture firms in the Philippines. For three years, designing for new constructions such as office buildings, malls, and condominiums. Desiring to focus then on her passion for built heritage, 
she shifted from designing new structures to protecting and conserving the old. Architect Balaguer is now a museum researcher in the architectural arts and built heritage division of the National Museum of the Philippines. Currently, she is a delegate for the Simeo Spafa Disaster Risk Management for Cultural Heritage in Southeast Asia Training, where advocates and professionals from Southeast Asian countries are being trained on how to protect the built heritage from hazards such as earthquakes and typhoons, something our country experiences frequently. Ladies and gentlemen, architect Bernadette Balaguer. And so good morning, everyone. Um, uh, welcome to our webinar for today. Uh, as a celebration for the National Heritage Month, um, entitled Of Galleons and Churches, Local Influences in Maritime Trade and Architecture in the Philippines during the Spanish colonial period. So for, for this morning, I will focus on um, Philippine church architecture. Um, my lecture is entitled Local Influences on Philippine Churches, specifically uh, the Nuestra Señora de, Cas de Caizase Church and its associated structures in Taal, Batangas. So for today, um, there will be four parts of the lecture. Uh, first, I will be sharing an overview of the architectural development of the churches in the Spanish colonial period. And then a brief introduction and historical timeline of the Caizase Church. And um, next is the local influences on its architecture. And lastly, the state of conservation of the church. So as a brief overview, um, as the arrival of the Spaniards brought upon um, Christianity to the Philippine Islands, um, churches um, mark uh, the beginning of a new religion adopted by the Filipinos. And uh, um, the architectural development um, that is representative of Hispanic influences. So um, there are actually two influ um, major influences of, in terms of architecture. One is the Bahay na Bato, and second is the church. So uh, churches are one of the colonial marks of um, Spanish era architecture. So as evangelization grew in our country, um, there, um, the certain orders are formed to have missions in different provinces, such as the Augustinians, Franciscans, Dominicans, um, Jesuits, Recollects, and the Seculars. So on the left um, part of the slide, here is a map of uh, the provinces of these orders. But for today, we're going to focus on the Augustinian churches. So here is one example of an Augustinian church. This is the Mag Magao Church in Iloilo. So the uh, Augustinian started evangelizing in 1565 here in the Philippines. And they, they have the largest number of parishes built or churches and mostly these churches are in baroque style so again uh, here is a map showing um, the provinces um, and the churches that uh, the augustinians built so these hispanic philippine churches also embody um, local elements or what we call filipino elements uh, in terms of architecture so early churches was built of local and light materials such as um, wood, rattan, nipa, bamboo, reed. So here is a photo, an uh, example of a chapel in Baco or Cavite. So as uh, churches are being um, exposed to different natural hazards knowing the geographical location and the climate of the Philippines, so um, Spanish friars introduced the use of more sturdy building materials, such as timber, timber hardwood, um, adobe stones, or, or volcanic tough rocks, coral stones, and lime and bricks. 
So what actually distinguishes the architecture of our Philippine churches? So um, uh, despite having uh, Hispanic influences in terms of style and planning, um, having a church and plaza complex, um, uh, there are certain elements or very small details that is representative of um, local building tradition here in the Philippines. So one of which is um, locally sourced building materials. So um, churches built in coastal regions are um, using uh, building materials that are available. So one example is the shell ornaments used on a um, arc uh, design in, a, in the Giwan Church in Eastern Summer, which is the church is very known for this kind of ornamentation. And another is a volcanic stone used in the ruins of the Kagsawa Church because you know um, it is near the, volca the Mayon volcano. And another is the use of capiz shells um, in many um, historic structures and of course in churches also. So an, uh, an example here is the interior of the Santa Ana Convent in Manila. So another um, local influences is sec the motifs or the ornamentation that is inspired by native flora and, and fauna here in the Philippines. So the perfect example for this is the Miagao Church in Iloilo. Uh, yung central pediment niya may design ng um, bar-relief of coconut tree and, sa, and the sides niya may mga um, papaya. And the third one is the geography and climate responsive design. So there was um, a certain style of Baroque churches um, that was introduced here in the Philippines uh, called the Earthquake Baroque. And uh, one example is the Pawai Church. That's why it has very large volute um, buttresses. And the fourth is the exhibition of local craftsmanship that um, also we can see on the interiors of many churches. <clears throat> so now we're go going to take a look uh, uh, specifically at the case of the Nuestra Señora de, Ca de Caizasay Church and um, taking into consideration all the local influences and also exploring and delving into how it was um, exhibited here in the Caizasay Church. So the Caizasay Church is a declared National Cultural Treasure by the National Museum of the Philippines in March 2020. It is located in Taal, a coastal town south of Batangas, and approximately uh, 16 kilometers southwest of the Taal Volcano. And so here are maps showing the location of the Kaisasay Church. <clears throat> so um, before that, um, let's have a brief overview of the history of the Taal, uh, or the Kaisase Church. So the, the Kaisase Church story started when a local um, named Juan Maningkad found a um, carved wooden image of the Virgin Mary at the Pansipit River in Taal. And then um, in 1611, there are um, accounts of the locals having a parish um, Seeing apparitions of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Okay, in 1611 also, a church of light materials was built near the Pansipit River for uh, to celebrate or as veneration to the wooden image that was found by the local fishermen. Okay, so in 1620, Augustinians issue a decree to build a stone church um, near near the where the apparition of the Blessed Virgin Mary occurred. So in 1639, a reef stone church was built. Uh, it is made of coral stone and completed in 1640. So at, uh, around that same time, a arc structure was also built um, called the Balon, and now it is called the Balon de Santa Lucia. And it is known for the sacred water and a, actually, this is a sacred site for the locals. <clears throat> so, in 
And then in 1754, a violent Taal volcano eruption occurred or happened, and the church was partially destroyed by boulders and ash from Taal volcano. So affected no eruption, yung uh, roof of the apse of the church. And then in 1755, a year after, uh, Hagdan Hagdan was constructed. Actually, uh, these associated structures of uh, the Kaisasai Church Convent Complex are uh, very distinct to this church. It, um, it, I think it is the only church that has, or one of the few churches that has a very high stairway. This Hagdan Hagdan is a 120 steps. Um, stairway and also on the right photo you'll see a uh, photo taken from the Kaisasai church you can see the balloon and the hagdan hagdan juxtaposed um, across each other and also in and then in 1850 the original adobe steps was replaced by um, piedra china or Chinese granite slabs and mid 19th century a convent was built at the site and in 1852 another um, earthquake uh, happened in Taal where walls in the church of the towers fell and in 1856 a uh, reco reconstruction was completed so in 1867 uh, the church was damaged again and the, they um, had minor uh, repair and also, um, the interior was decorated by Cesar, Cesar Alberoni, an artist who also painted um, the ceiling paintings of the Taal Basilica. And so this is a, a condition um, photograph or a painting um, taken from the, uh, after the condition of the Kaisasai Church in 1904, painted in 1904. And and again, in 1911, a very violent Taal volcano eruption occurred that, that caused damage to, to the shrine. And here are some photos. And in 1952, it was reconstructed. And here is a um, marker that proves its reconstruction. So uh, here is a brief historical summary of the important events um, through the centuries. And, and so now we focus on the architectural side of the Kaisasai Church. So as a side-by-side -side comparison, um, the Taal town has uh, two uh, churches, um, one of which is the Taal Basilica. It, it is the town church and the Kaisasai Church. Church. So, yung pinagkaiba nila, yung Taal is a basilica and the Kaisasai is called the pilgrimage churches. So, um, yun nga, as evangelization grew in the country, nag-emerge din yung iba't ibang type ng churches. So, one of which is the pilgrimage church. And so, here is an overview of um, the whole complex of the Kaisasai uh, and its condition right now. So, as I've mentioned, uh, the Kaisasai Church is usually small and, um, and usually may mga stairs, may stairs na na-access na um, sa kamarin or sa likod ng altar para mahawakan ng mga deboto yung uh, image of, a, of the Blessed Virgin Mary or or um, the saint that is uh, venerated at the pilgrimage church. And so here is um, condition photos or um, how the coral stones was applied to the walls of the churches. So this is um, one remarkable local influence because as we, as, as I've mentioned earlier, na. Okay, Sasai Church was built at the coastal town of Batangas. So usually, um, the use of build, building materials um, for the structures along coastal regions 
are uh, remarkably uh, there. We have the coral stones. Yeah. And this is a diagram of a basic or a typical masonry wall. So usually, yung core work, nandun yung rubble work. And then sa face work, uh, in the case of Kaisasai, uh, there are cut coral stones. Yeah. So this is a overview. And um, also in the walls and architectural surfaces, um, this is what the coral stone looked like, uh, unplastered, as seen from the uh, interior. And um, on the right side is a um, photo of the Kaisasai Church in 1880. So we can see a few, few changes um, during uh, all these years. Yeah. And here is the nave of the church that is plastered and now it is painted in yellow, uh, a bit yellowish and white in color. And next is um, the roof and dome of the church. So um, one of the remarkable features or distinct um, feature of the Kaisasai church in, in its architecture is the use of quadrangular uh, pyramidal dome and uh, made of roof tiles. So uh, this is a um, diagram of the, how roof tiles were installed. And this is a, a archival photo um, that, that proves that there, there is uh, the use of the roof tiles of the church. So during our assessment and inspection, we actually had um, time to access the the attic, the roof attic of the nave, and the roof attic of the abscess of the church. So this photo shows, or, or based on our visual observation during the, our field work, um, we can see in the very end some of uh, the original um, framework of the church are still there and it's intact and there are very few uh, mismatch and also sign of termite infestations but most of the members are still intact so this proves um, the use of um, you know uh, the roof tiles uh, as covering of the church before and now it is uh, from what we can see now is it is made of uh, sheet metal or iron corrugated metal. And one of the f detail that we observed on the roof is the cor corbels. It is, um, these corbels is uh, used to connect the masonry and the roof framework together. So actually most of the corbels and and as you observed on its um, uh, photos, yung mga key niya is still intact then. So, and this is a blow up or, or exploded detail of the similar case in Bolohoon, um, Gran Balwarte in Cebu, um, which is a very similar method of construction um, with the Kaisasai Church. So here is a documentation of um, the church. Now, actually, one of the local influences also that we saw is the use of the capitals. Actually, we are very happy to see this um, existing capitial window. Um, actually, we think that it's the only one uh, na makita natin doon. So kaya siya siguro hindi... Um, Nabago is because um, kanina sa timeline natin, di ba later on pa nadagdag yung convent. So this side of the church um, attaches to the convent. Kaya um, this may be that kaya nag exist pa rin yung um, capitial window na to. It's because um, less yung exposure niya to um, deterioration or climatic um, factors. And um, this is um, the baldosa that is used in 
the Camarin. And also, uh, these are the tiles uh, in Ardell pattern of black and white marble. And so this is the retablo. It's a neoclassic retablo and uh, it is made of wood. And right now the base is made of concrete. And one of uh, also the influences here in the Kaisasay church, aside from local or and Hispanic influences, is um, the Chinese uh, influence because it, they were part of the construction team that built the church. So it is manifested through the Chinese dragon at the entablature of the retablo. So another important and distinct um, structure in the complex is the Balon de Santa Lucia. Um, it is made of coral stone and the base is made of adobe stones. So looking at the pediment of, I'm oh, sorry. And looking at the pediment of the balloon, um, it has a central figure or barrelief of the Our Lady of Kaisasai and foliage embellishments on its sides. And um, so I think that's one of the local influence also found in the Kaisasai church because um, maybe uh, the constructors or the laborers or the maestros de obras um, actually take pattern of the environment surrounding its natural setting and use that as an inspiration to carve um, out this um, heavily ornamented foliage pediment. And so lastly, uh, the state of conservation of the Kaisase Church is generally intact and fair to good state of conservation in different states of repair. So we still see um, some issues, but um, there are evidences that are found uh, of its historic and authentic state. So actually, these are um, the local influences that still exist or that are extant. And also, um, we can refer to um, archival photos. So these are worth considering in terms of um, uh, having, um, in terms of the restoration or protection of the church. So these are the distinct features and significant features that um, worth considering in terms of um, its conservation and protection as well. And so this is an aerial shot of uh, the Kaisasay Church, the convent, and Hagdan Hagdan, and also the Balon. And then, so as I end my presentation, I hope you um, learned a lot of about the Kaisasay Church. And I, I also would like to um, invite that uh, the, our heritage structures need more appreciation and also um, we can uh, take a look at its story and its unique distinct features. And this is actually uh, one step uh, of um, one step in the proactive engagement in terms of uh, the protection and conservation of our heritage. And so thank you. And also I'd like to thank um, the Archdiocese Shrine uh, of Kaisasay, um, Father Raul and also architect Axel um, Katapang for uh, in their assistance for the research and that is very instrumental for the study. Thank you. Thank you so much, Architect Bernadette. We are also honored to welcome our reactor discussant for today's lecture, who is joining us virtually from Cebu City. 
She is the founding dean of the University of San Carlos College of Architecture and Fine Arts, now Sc School of Architecture, Fine Arts, and Design. She is the founding director of the USC College of Architecture and Fine Arts Heritage Conservation Studios and Workshops. She co-authored the book entitled The Illustrated Manual for the Repair and Maintenance of Spanish Period Structures in the Philippines with Dr. Raymond Becker Ritterspach, published by University of San Carlos Press in 2018. She is a member of the ICOMAS International Committee on Places of Religion and Ritual with her years of experience in conserving built heritage in the Philippines. She is one of the respected conservation architects in our country. So without further ado, let, let me now introduce to you our guest reactor discussant, architect Melva Rodriguez Hava. Good morning, architect. Yes, hello. Thank you so much for the generous introduction. Good morning and thank you for having me here. I would also like to congratulate not only the National Museum of the Philippines for conducting this series of webinars, which are very educational, but most especially this morning for the beautiful presentation of architect Bernadette. So since I am given the assignment of being discussant, I would just like to kind of um, put on the floor two or three observations uh, that will possibly lead us to learning more about what can be done about historic churches like the one we saw in Kaisasai. So first of all, from the beautiful presentation, uh, we, we noticed that the church had undergone several disasters from the eruption of the volcano. So maybe what I'd like to know is what kind of disaster risk management has been put in place in case there are future, heaven forbid, <laughs> there are future destruction uh, to the church caused by natural calamities or even man-made disasters. So Miss Bernadette, uh, can you tell us what are being put in place to kind of address future damage that might occur from natural or, or human caused disasters? Hi, um, um, I architect uh, Melba Hava. I'm thankful for um, gracing, I'm thankful for uh, your presence gracing us today. And actually, that is a very um, good point. And that, um, I, um, actually, from what we've observed on our inspections, uh, the the church um, structural or the roof framework and the connection of of uh, the corbels to the masonry walls actually um, very surprising. Na it, it's still intact, and that's very good. And um, this can be uh, a clue na yung mga dating nagbuild ng church, they, they took on to consideration yung seismic design. Yes. Yes. And also yung um, one of which is the thickness of the masonry wall. Right. And actually, um, right now, I am... Uh, undergoing a disaster risk management training uh -huh. uh, for cultural heritage, and I also um, use the Kaisasay Church as, as a case study. So um, the the study for the church is still ongoing, and um, and I hope and uh, na maging successful siya. And um, I'm I'm still planning na to talk to or engage more on the locals and also the local government to actually know their plans in terms of disaster risk management. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Bernadette. Um, I'm glad you mentioned that uh, 
you're, there's there's a plan to engage the local stakeholders. That is a very important uh, uh, factor in the work to preserve and and sustain the the integrity of the church. I notice some in some of the pictures that some of the coral stones are suffering from what we call black encrustation, and in that beautiful little structure that you call the balloon, um, there's uh, quite a healthy growth of vegetation on top of the beautiful ornate pediment that can easily be removed. And probably with the formation of some kind of a local workforce in the parish or in the LGU where you have uh, trained technicians or or even masons who are trained to remove this, this vegetative growth before they really you know, penetrate into the coral stone and cause the loosening of the stones, maybe it can be done. So maybe a good maintenance um, plan for sustainability of the materials and the, and the methods used in the church can be had. And I'm very happy that you are there and you are very much involved in the in the care and preservation of the church. This probably can be done like a, a, a draft or outline form of conservation management plan, which details like uh, what are the priorities to be addressed in the church and uh, what can be done within the local resources, like uh, Within, within the given technical expertise of the people in a workforce and with, with, the, with the available funding, of course, because anything we do for the church, no, we'll have to spend like herbicides and then um, chemicals also and, and other implements and tools to remove the black encrustation and so on. But uh, aside from that, I, I did notice in one of the pictures that there was a vertical crack on one of the walls I wonder what caused the crack. Could it have been like a movement of the ground beneath the church? And if so, it may need some archaeological investigation to find out if there was movement at all. And if there was movement of the ground, how can that be addressed to limit the effect of such movement on the structural integrity of the walls? Is somebody looking in, into that, Miss Bernadette? Right, I, right, ma'am. Actually, you pointed out, out a lot of um, you know good points in terms of the conservation and also considering um, its exposure to a lot of natural hazards and um, some uh, some human induced hazards as well. And um, I'd like to stress on. Also, with uh, the collaboration and our engagement with the locals, actually, the um, I think uh, ang swerte kasi very engaged yung museum and also the archdiocese or the shrine, and also some local um, heritage advocates that yeah. also take time to study and uh, research, like uh, architect Axel Katapang and. They're very instrumental to um, the success um, of whatever um, we are planning. And yeah. In terms of um, addressing some of um, you know the issues or challenges of the church right now or its in its condition, um, so uh, also the church is very blessed with a budget to conduct uh, urgent repairs. And um, before actually uh, naging discussion between uh, National Museum and the locals and the site managers um, to uh, set priorities for uh, I mean, to better use of the resources. Yes, uh, yes that, that's given to us. And right. one of which is actually yung, uh, learning or studying, uh, having assessments or scientific investigations that can be 
a baseline information of whatever um uh tag dito, whatever solution mm -hmm. that we're going to take on in terms of the repair and yeah so that's it Thank you so much, Architect Bernadette. I, I'm happy to know about the involvement of your colleagues there and the local stakeholders. Um, however, another important uh, component in the conservation and protection of our, of our cultural heritage, especially the churches, which you are studying, which is a very happy thing, um, is also the participation of the local commission for culture and the arts of the of the diocese. Uh, do you have such kind of commission there, and are they actively participating in in the preservation and conservation of the heritage churches within the diocese, especially Kaisai Sai? Mm -hmm. um, actually, uh, uh, during the commencement of the project or the early stages, uh, <clears throat> there was a stakeholders meeting that, that took place and uh, the other cultural agencies are also present. Mm -hmm. and, um, everyone from the heritage advocates, um, from the locals, um, even um, representative from the Archdiocese of Lipa and mm -hmm. so, um, the provincial government. So it was a good start, actually. The the oh, planning for wonderful, yeah. It's 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 very nice to know that there's this ongoing um, collaboration among the different uh, uh, parties involved in the in the uh, protection and conservation of our heritage churches within the archdiocese. And well, finally, probably, I would like to ask because, as we know, tayong architects ba. We're looking into the function, the materials, technology, the right? and the form. The form, we did not have too much choice because basically it was brought in by the Spaniards. And during that time that they, they arrive on our shores, it was the Baroque style of architecture that was in modo then in, in Europe. No? So they brought in kind of ideas about the Baroque, although our expression of the Baroque, we call it Philippine Baroque because it's really a a toned down version of the very effusive uh, Baroque style, especially in the latter part of the Baroque period, the Rococo. But we, di we do see some of those in our retablos, although in your retablo, I notice it's simpler, it's neoclassic. But uh, I, I, really, I really am enamored by that balloon that you show because of the very effusive uh, floral ornamentation uh, there's one thing I noticed though. The name was uh, Saint Santa Lucia. Uh, is it is it that the figure there was that of Santa Lucia, which is which is mentioned in in the pediment, or is it the Blessed Virgin? I am not too sure now. Uh, who's, who that figure is? You, you might want to clarify that also because people who visit might want to know exactly who is uh, represented in that figure. I'm sorry, uh, er, ma'am, are you asking about uh, why is it called the Ballon de Santa Lucia? Um, oh, yes, yes, yes. Maybe maybe that can answer my 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 query. Uh, why is it called the Santa Lucia, Ballon de Santa Lucia? Mm -hmm. um, uh, actually, there, was, there wasn't really a, an explanation or I haven't come across a, an archival... A document explaining um, why the why Santa, why is it called Santa Lucia, okay. and it's actually more on uh, celebrating uh, the Our Lady of Kaisasay. So, so based sa iconography, also uh, sa central ano niya, ornamentation at the round part. Um, I think it's more on uh, it more represents more on the Our Lady of Kaisasay. But okay. then um, there were um, stories of the locals na there was a, I think, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, a blind woman uh, that saw, uh, I think, a blinding light or I think the Our Lady of Kaisasay appeared to her. And 
maybe uh, that's uh, doon nila nakuha yung um, uh, uh, ang dito? reason kung bakit siya tinawag na Balon de Santa Lucia kasi si Santa Lucia yung um, I think one of yung ano niya sa iconography is the eyes yeah Lucia Lucia means light really no uh, so probably that's that's it no? yeah. okay. it, would, it would be good to know uh, more about that so that uh, you know, a story, a little story can be had, you know, right there at the balloon after it is cleaned, of course, of the vegetation. It's such a nice little structure. It's very interesting. It also needs to be conserved, especially the stonework also below, below that, that, that little, you know, chapel-like uh, formation. My final point na lang, Miss Bernadette, if you don't mind, um, we were talking about the technology. We we're talking about the, the nice, uh, artwork. Uh, just a word about the function though, because in our old churches brought in by, you know, plants were brought in by the friars, no? As we could see in your presentation, it's a cruciform plan. But after the requirements of Vatican II, which called for a more active participation of the people, many new churches have, have assumed new forms like elliptical or or, you know, um, rectangular, which allow the people to go a little bit closer to the altar and nearer the altar, so that this kind of more dynamic participation of the assembly with the priest can, can be had. Now, I wonder how this can happen in, in old churches like what you have in Kaisasai, which is longitudinal, uh, the priests up there near the apse in the retablo where the, where the people are below. Uh, is there something being done in terms of replanning the interior appointments or special disposition of the church so that the Vatican II um, advice of more dynamic participation on the part of the assembly can, can be had, can happen? As of now, I'm not yet aware if there were changes in terms of uh, the consideration of the Vatican to um, plan prescription in terms of the planning of the churches. Um, but there were, um, at some point, uh, an iron balustrade was constructed uh, separating the altar and um, the part of the public. Yes. Of the mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that's um, one uh, consideration. And also observe, as, at least from my observation at, uh, during the assessment or the inspection, um, it wasn't really that, I think, that far. Uh, yung, you know, the church is really very small, uh, 50 meters mm -hmm. long in terms of the length. Yes. I think uh, I'll take a look more uh, and research on it if there were changes. Yes, yes. Yeah, we may need really to coordinate more closely with the Archdiocesan Commission for the Heritage of the Church. But um, overall, um, I really appreciate your presentation, Miss Bernadette, and I congratulate you for the passion that you have in the care of our heritage churches, and I hope you will be able to convince also young architects like you are, you know, in, in the universities to go into this uh, advocacy because not only are the churches the most ubiquitous uh, legacies that we have in terms of colonial structure, but also they are really still, you know, what we call living heritage because we still use them and uh, they are very important spaces where we can go in and do our worship and adoration and hopefully we can make the churches speak also more of the transcendence that is needed when we come to our God and people really do need need sacred spaces to just go into and have a one-on-one -on -one, if you will with the Lord and then taking care of these spaces is very crucial to us uh, indiv individually as a people and, and, and as a country. 
for for every for every people who practice the faith. Thank you so much again, Bernadette, and I congratulate you for your work. Uh, thank you also, Ma'am uh, Architect Hava, and of course, I'd like to also consult you um, whenever I think I have new findings. I think um, your research on the churches in Cebu and Bohol are, have a lot of, um, I mean, in terms of the construction, have a lot of similarities. Oh, yes. I yes. Yeah, I've seen your, actually your book. And also, um, your point on uh, churches as the living heritage is very important because in terms of conservation of our heritage, um, you should also uh, take time to know yung mga practices, lifestyle, and rituals, tradition of the locals. And actually also engaging them on, on whatever you plan for the heritage structures. And uh, I think um, it is the responsibility of our, uh, the heritage agencies or cultural agencies as well to educate them and capacitate them. Uh, to strengthen local knowledge and um, yes, uh, more you know Bernadette I'm very happy that you mentioned also about about the locals and their expression of faith because there is such a thing as folk religiosity and they may not be the same as what we see in Europe or in other countries but we have to kind of accommodate them also like like here in Santo Nino um, of course the main nave of the church is for the liturgy but Outside, they really put there the statues of the Blessed Virgin, the Santo Nino, where people can really just go and touch and, you know, hold the hand of the Blessed Mother. They, they think this is one way of showing devotion, and that is very folk religiosity, but we, I think that should be allowed because that is an expression of their spirituality and an expression of their faith, no? And I think that in some churches which, which in which these statuaries are removed after Vatican II is not doing a good service to the ordinary folk who want also to express their own religiosity in the very traditional, endemic, indigenous, uh, folksy mm -hmm. way, which is just as valid to the Lord, I, I believe, if we, we allow them to continue. Yes, and that's part um, as well of uh, you know, yung attitude or um, strengths of the Filipinos, you know, we ha we need to have a certain tangible manifestation. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes. yes. Thank you so much. I enjoyed talking to you. Thank you so much, Renata. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Architect Melva and Architect Badet. Uh, that, that was such a wonderful discussion. So, we will proceed now with the open forum. So, yung Mga participants po natin uh, na may mga tanong, please uh, do uh, type in your questions in the chat box. And also, for, for those who are, are streaming live, uh, you may chat your questions in our YouTube uh, chat box. So th there is this one question uh, that came in uh, while you're discussing about, I think, uh, the question is from John Paul Abilera. Uh, does, does it have something to do with St. Lucy curing blindness? Okay. Um, I think we still have to look into that or on why uh, the balloon was called the Ballon de Santa Lucia. And that's... Um, another uh, angle of the story or, or maybe reason why is it named that way? Yeah. Uh, another question from Mr. John Paul. Uh, given the recent eruptions of Taal Volcano, how can the Kaisasa Church be protected? I think there are um, lots of uh, levels or um, angles we have to to take into consideration on how we are going to protect the Kaisase Church. Um, one is, of course, um, we need to do um, 
assessments and uh, scientific studies to um, to know more about or understand more about its current condition. And maybe uh, this can be a basis uh, for future interventions. And there are lots to take into consideration, such as um, yung, uh, how do we make the church more stable or um, does the study say na it's is it uh, is the structural stability really compromised or and then another thing is the wind and water tightness uh, uh, on the doors and windows of the church and another um, uh, strategy also is to have um, and a you know check the man in terms of the management um, having disaster risk management plan as well will help and also um, having um, conservation management plan and um, you know build and also be building maintenance system and also for future intervention of the church um, it is our goal to uh, it is our goal to um, uh, it is our, our goal to uh, take into consideration or um, base future interventions on conservation management plan and I, I think Doc Anna is raising her hand. Uh, Ma'am Anna, uh, do you have something to say or ask? Yeah, I think uh, Badet is a, a bit uh, nervous, but um, she's, she's um, really raising some very, very important uh, points. And uh, architect Melva also um, um, inquired if uh, we're also doing um, an interdisciplinary um, program for uh, the restoration. Actually, when we went there in January 14 this year, uh, we already brought our team. Um, it, you know, the, for instance, um, archaeological aspect of the uh, research is also um, going to happen, and uh, also the the ethnographic aspect of it. So we'll be combining all our efforts with the um, uh, conservation and restoration uh, teams so that um, what we will be able to do is to be very, very uh, um, useful and also it will go through a positive process. And also I think, um, uh, can you mention Architect Balaguer, the architect the uh, local architect from Taal, with whom we are working with, um, because he's done quite a lot in terms of documentation already. In fact, he's made it easier for us. So maybe you could mention him because he's quite important. And also the, the local uh, church um, council and also the because, you know, it, as you know, Taal is a very historical place. There's a lot of um, heritage uh, um, buildings also in terms of the residences. So uh, it was uh, a lot of people were very involved during the meeting. So perhaps uh, Architect Malaga, you can mention our, our friend, uh, local architect in, in the area. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Doc Anna. Thank you, uh, Ma'am Anna. And... Yeah, uh, we'd like, uh, the National Museum also would like to thank uh, architect Axel Katapang from ta uh, the, a local in Taal. I don't know if he's present, <laughs> and, but he's done a lot of uh, work and documentation of the church. And, that, and um, the engagement with him or the collaboration with him is very instrumental to... Um, to the endeavors that the National Museum is doing. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Architect Bedet. Uh, I'd like to encourage the, uh, our YouTube viewers. I, 
you may also ask your question and we'll try our best to answer those. So we have a question from um, Mr. Jun Galang. The question is in relation to the Chinese lion at the retablo. There is another pair of Chinese lion. These were made of stones. Have you determined where these were formerly located since they are now in the convent? Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, uh, during our inspection, we saw these, uh, the pair of the, the Chinese lions at the convent. Um, now, it is, I think, uh, during the inspection, and siya sa may entrance ng um, office or office of the shrine. And um, we are currently uh, undergoing research and gathering more information um, na talagang uh, mapuprove kung saan siya located. You know, um, these Chinese lions also is a mark of Chinese influence on the Kaisasai Church. And yeah, um, so I think that that is one important or significant um, detail that we should um, to take into consideration in terms of restoration. So usually, um, these Chinese lions are located uh, sa entrances or maybe also one um, theory is uh, maybe it's located on the Hagdan, part of the Hagdan Hagdan. We are not, um, we have no definitive uh, answer as of the moment. I think um, that's uh, for further study as well. Okay, uh, another question from Joanne Constantino. Uh, you mentioned that Kaisasai Church has capis, capis shells. Uh, can you expound more on the benefits of using it? Uh, since uh, capis are our local pride, do you think these are helpful alternatives and are these durable to withstand strong typhoon, rains, and winds? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you for that question. Um, I, the usage of the capitals, um actually before, um, so maraming heritage structures na gumagamit nun, uh, on the windows and some of the uh, transom of the doors. Um, we can see it in a lot of structures, not just in churches, in um, bahay na bato um, in some schools like PNU, and I, I I do agree that it is one of our local pride. And before, ginamit siya as an alternative for uh, the use of glass windows, because before glass was um, expensive, and um, capitals is um, very abundant on our coastal regions. And I think yung certain, um, yung distinct manner of how they put together the capitial, uh, the lattice work helped, um, help uh, the window or fenestration be more adaptive for, uh, in terms of wind and water tightness. In, um, to withstand strong winds and typhoon. And there was a study. Na it's uh, actually very additive with glass. And um, also, we need to take into consideration yung um, ma maintenance ng capi shells. They are very delicate. Uh, I mean, um, madali din siyang uh mag deteriorate in uh, like kasi ano siya, uh, organic material siya. and also we do have a exhibition on the capis use of capis shells in manila's built heritage here in the museum and i think um it very comprehensive then yung exhibition and, and explaining the use of capis shells in lots of heritage structures and Pag open na kami, it's worth checking out. Okay, uh, uh, 
We have a question from our YouTube user, Mr. Richard Marrero. In restoration po, uh, same materials pa rin po ba ang ginagamit or alternative materials na po? Mm, okay, in terms of um, restoration, um, we know na some materials are not available um, right now. Um, like um, coral stones and um, I think that is a consideration in terms of um, planning for the restoration of heritage structures. And so if kung, um, we're very lucky na meron pa rin material or permitted tayo gumamit ng um, traditional materials, um, I think we should make use of that. And also, um, we should um, anong tawag dito? Uh, adapt as well the heritage structures uh, um, with the modern uh, construction. Of course, this is this should be this intervention should be based on the conservation management plans and um, studies to better support um, the solutions we have to do. All right, thank you. Uh, you may personally ask your questions uh, sa ating mga participants. So, kay Emilev Cabrera, uh, do you want to personally ask your question or ako na lang ba ang magbabasa? Uh, you have the option to personally ask your questions sa ating speaker. Sa mga participants natin dito sa Zoom. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. Ako na lang. <laughs> Thank you. So, okay. Um, pero uh, I encourage uh, everyone na uh, feel free to ask uh, personally. So, ang question niya is, uh, ayan, good morning. Uh, my question is a bit legal in nature, so please forgive me. Yeah. Given that RA 11333 or the National Museum of the Philippines Act is in effect since April 2019, and it states that regulatory functions of the NMP as provided by RA-166, RA-9492, and PD-374 will be transferred to the NCAA. NCCA, sorry. Uh, will the transfer include the responsibility to maintain and monitor built heritage sites declared by the NMP prior the implementation of RA-1133. Ayan. Mm -hmm. So, mm. yun, architect for that. Yeah. <laughs> yun uh, okay. I'm not really sure or very equipped with information regarding this, but I, I'm aware na um, regu regulatory powers were transferred to the, to the NCCA. And in terms of I think in terms of um, the restoration of the Kaisase Church, um, since uh, it was a project of the National Museum, I think we will co still continue um, being the one to administer um, the project. And so I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Okay. Uh, I hope na sagut ba yun tanong mo <laughs> sir. Uh, so uh, if ever you may do, do some follow up question. Uh, another question is uh, from Ma Maria Rodora. Ma'am, you have you have an idea if there are notes or source about budget used for building the church structures and repairs. San po nang gagaling ang fund at estimate po ng money spent for the building. Salamat po. Yeah. Um, in terms of the, uh, the Kaisasay Church um, repair project, uh, it was a, a fund uh, given to the national given to the National Museum and also part 
um, part of uh, the funds as well is I think from the locals na from funds of the archdiocese mismo. Ayan. Okay, so thank you. Uh, another question from our YouTube uh, subscriber, MIG from MIG Pilot. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I just noticed the documentation of most heritage churches are mostly from Luzon and Visayas. Any interesting church from Mindanao or Zamboanga? Yes, I think uh, there are few churches in Mindanao, and um, and uh, the division has undergone a uh, state of conservation um, assessment as well on those churches. And uh, um, I think uh, also personally, I um, also need to study more of the churches in Mindanao. There, the landscape there is also very interesting and different from Luzon and Visayas. And um, yeah, that's uh, one consideration in terms of research and study. Thank you for pointing that, uh, that out. Um, another question from uh, Hilda Lagbinet. Uh, would you like to ask your question, personally ask your question? Uh, po natin yan, ano? Ms. Hilda? Ah, okay, sige. So ako na lang din ulit na magbabasa. Uh, as an architect, what was your most challenging experience encountered while doing your fieldwork for Heritage Church like the Our Lady of Kaisasay? Thanks. I think uh, one of the most challenging part of uh, researching on built heritage structures is actually looking for a lot of evidences and um, scanning through a lot of uh, book references, um, archival documents, and um, primary documents that can help or na, na dapat also we can check and that's um, I think um, it's a very tedious work and actually um, searching for a single single detail w will take a lot of time and um, also yung so hindi lang basta also nakita natin siya on archival photos na it, it, it was helpful but also we can these things are still being discussed kung magiging priority ba siya in terms of the project there can be limitations and I think um, there were cha challenges, there are a lot of challenges pero I think mas um, naging mas exciting yung experience and mas um, amazing <laughs> Uh, checking these heritage churches kasi uh, I think isa sa mga hindi ko makakalimutan na moments in the inspection of the church is yung umakyat kami sa ceiling ng uh, ng Kaisasay Church it was, it was very um, tiring pero um, uh, very rewarding naman yung mga nakuha namin information and observation during that inspection yeah Uh, for, for our participants, uh, baka meron din kayong questions na, na addressed to architect Melva. Uh, she's still with us now, so uh, pwede pa rin po kayo magtanong. And uh, another, there's a comment here sa chat box ng Zoom. Uh, comment lang po. I think uh, the reason there were few Spanish colonial era churches in Mindanao is due to the fact that uh, the island was not fully Christianized because mm -hmm. of heavy resistance 
from the Islamic political entities existing already prior to the arrival of the Spaniards. Yeah. From Malot. Hi, Malot. Um, would you like to ask your question? Uh, straight from Vegan. Hi, Malot. Hello. Yes. Hello, Alvin. Uh, yes. Kasi ibabasa ko na lang para yes. sa ano. Yeah, um, I, I'm just wondering, no, um, uh, are we, I mean, the concerned divisions, no, this is for the built heritage division specifically. So is the National Museum also conducting studies on potential alternative uh, materials uh, for our built heritage? Uh, yung instance dito, yung example ko ay dito sa Ilocos kasi where our built heritage, like the ancestral houses and the churches, uh, much of this, in much of this, ay ginamit ang... ang ang lime, lime powder that's uh, particularly made of uh, coral rubble. So in the past, we 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 really produced uh, lime powder at, out of coral rubble for for our buildings. No? And now, uh, given the environmental laws, uh, hindi na tayo pwede kasi na kasi nasabi, parang blanket kasi yung yung isang provision sa law. And wherein hindi na pwedeng mag-exploit ng coral. And that would mean if you really strictly observe that, uh, hindi na tayo makakagawa ng lime powder out of even uh, coral rubble. So, meron ba tayong alternative sources na pwedeng gawin na lime powder that would still yung parang, yung, yung it, it would still be the same effect, kumbaga, yung, yung quality. Kasi, uh, tinatanong ko naman na ito kasi ang itong itong traditionally produced lime powder din dito kasi sa amin ay food grade din. It's not just used in built heritage on built heritage but also in the purification of uh, ano yung sugar cane juice. Uh, actually we need we need lime powder for uh, the production of uh, what you call Moscovado, o yung sa amin ay tagapulot, no? Uh, and even in uh, the purification of to make uh, basi, uh, so some uh, some sugarcane manufacturers uh, use that. So there's a bit of uh, like a problem kasi nga yung environmental law natin ay blanket yung kanyang effect, no? Dun sa sa restriction at uh, na rinig ko na na hindi kasi pareho ang hindi kasi pareho ang quality kumbaga if you get a lime powder from from other sources that are not harimbawa hindi galing sa coral rubble ay iba yung epekto nun. so i'm just wondering kung ano yung studies natin na ginagawa uh, patungkol sa ganito yun lang po maraming salamat yeah thank you <clears throat> Yeah. I think there are, um, in terms of yung use ng uh, this kind of materials like lime, um, we should really have uh, alternatives uh, in the present time to, you know, kasi um, actually yung mga heritage structures natin hindi um, built on a certain type of material and some materials do not adhere well to... Uh, or some uh, tag dito, like lime or the use of, for example, cement, they do not adhere well to other kinds of stones. So I think that's a very important point. And I, I am aware that there are um, alternatives, but I am not well informed yet on um, kung saan yung sources and also kung maybe may difference on the ratio <clears throat> so i think i'd i'd like to explore more on that um matter mamalot and we can uh, discuss it further maraming salamat po sa tingin ko napaka importante nga po talaga and if uh, 
kumbaga para sa akin kasi ha uh, coming from the Ilocos where that mm-hmm. it's very particular that that we need the traditionally produced lime not yeah. only for built heritage but for some traditional industries uh we really have to kumbaga like I, there's a sense of I, I feel a sense of urgency uh, in arriving at I mean in knowing uh, what the possible alternatives uh, could be and uh, it, it's a good point yung sinasabi mo na yung iba yung proportion kasi ang naging halimbawa yung alam niyo yung chicha corn di ba yung chicha corn na galing sa Ilocos mm-hmm. uh, yun ay kailangan din ng lime para magproduce ka ng ganon Uh, ang nangyari noong itinigil at, ipin- at ipinagbawal ang ipinagbawal at ang sabi ko rin na yung chicha cordo may lime so, yun po pang ano po yun Pure, pang purify uh, pang ano po yun pang linis doon sa corn kasi pang linis po ang lime powder food grade po yan eh. so anyway ang sinasabi ko po ang nakwento kasi na ang ng aming yung mga nakakaalam tungkol doon sa production no ang nangyari nung wala nang mabili na yung traditionally produced lime bumili po sila ng galing dito sa Central Luzon at ang nangyari po kung halimbawa 1 liter lang dati ang ginagamit nila doon sa uh, lime powder na out of coral rubble kailangan 5 times yung dami noong lime na galing sa Central Luzon na mukhang sa limestone gamit so ang ang kino-question ko diyan yung ano eh yung pagiging logical niya kasi oh ini stop mo yung pag-exploit doon sa coral rubble but, but you're exploiting a uh, in a greater amount of uh, limestone uh, para <laughs> ma-produce mo yung ano yung, yung po mga ganong issues po thank you po That's right uh, thank you ma'am oh, All right thank you So I wish we have more time to, uh, to answer all your questions, but uh, unfortunately, um, we, we have a, a limited time. So uh, can we still accommodate one more question or uh, what time check, please? I think that's all we have now. So, okay. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for all your questions. Okay, thank you. So, we would like to formally uh, present this certificate of appreciation to architect Bernadette Balaguer and to our resource, our guest architect Melva Rodriguez Hava for her invaluable time and for sharing her expertise during this webinar of galleons and churches, local influences in maritime trade and architecture in the Philippines during the Spanish colonial period. On May 28, 2021, 10, 30 a.m. to 12 p.m. at the National Museum of the Philippines, given this 28th day of May 2021 at the National Museum of the Philippines, Manila. Signed, Jeremy R. Barnes, Sesotri, Director General. So, Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Salamat po. So, um, meron po tayo yung uh, feedback form na i-send sa ating uh, chat box. Uh, Maki-fill in po uh, para din po sa inyong e-certificate. So, I'll, I'd like to invite everyone to to please attend uh, the part two of our webinar series. The title for Monday's webinar is uh, 300 Years of Maritime Trade in the Philippines, uh, 16th to 18th Century Uh, the shipwreck evidence. Uh, it will also be the same time slot with Mr. Bobby Aurelianeda Aurel- Aurel- 
uh, officer in charge of the MACHD. Uh, he will talk about the connection of global maritime trade with the local prevalence of blue and white ceramics in the Philippines from the 16th to 18th centuries common era. There, another interesting topic for Monday, so please register uh, and uh, invite uh, friends uh, to join us on Monday. Okay, so uh, we would like to invite everyone, all the Zoom participants, to please open your cameras for a photo op. I'd like to say hi to Doc Anna and DG Jeremy and to everybody at the National Museum. Thank you. Thank you again, architect. All right, so there. So, ready na ba sa ating photo op? So, at the count of three, uh, please flash your best smile. Sa mga naka-face mask, uh, smile with our eyes. Okay, ready? Three, two, one. Okay, for the next page, please. Uh, at the count of three again. Three, two, one. All right, so are we good now? Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. So, ayun po, uh, magkita-kita po tayo muli sa lunes, uh, same time, 10.30, so please register. And maraming maraming salamat po sa oras na inilaan nyo for this morning. Thank you and God bless everyone. Huwag pong kalimutan mag-fill in ng evaluation and feedback form para din po sa inyong mga e-certificates. Thank you.